I'm not going to talk about what we're all thinking about, but um, uh, the Kristallnacht is best understood as a state-sponsored pogrom against the civilian population of Jews and its institutions then in, in then Nazi Germany. While Jews and other vulnerable German citizens had been brutalized ever since Hitler gained power, Kristallnacht began the unleashing of systematic, full-scale violence against German Jews. A month later, Hitler's Reichstag speech would articulate his desire to see, quote, the annihilation of the Jewish race in Europe. The fact that I've been invited to give a talk at a secular university on Kristallnacht's anniversary illustrates the complex relationship between memory and scientific history writing. Please turn off your cell phones. <laughs> between commemoration and objective analysis, between the private sorrows of Jews and the curiosity and interest of the public, which may or may, not, may or may not be Jewish, in their fate during the brutal 20th century. My talk tonight, Dubnov's other daughter, Lucius Davidovich, and the beginnings, uh, beginning of Horbenforschung, translated here as Holocaust research, in the United States, deals directly with those issues by examining the life and historical writing of Lucy S. Davidovich. As Catherine mentioned, this talk tonight is part of a, a, a book that I've been working on for a very long time. Biographies seem simple at the beginning because they have a beginning and an end, and they're just an endless rabbit hole. That's all I can say. Um, um, I uh, was interested in Lucia Davidovich because of her great memoir, From That Place and Time, 1938 to 1947, which I commend to all of you. It's really just a fantastic book. But I was also interested in her because um, she moved politically from left to right. Again, it's very resonant with the moment we're in right here. She moved from left to right, as did some of the famous immigrant sons, the so-called New York intellectuals, and I'm situating her with them, although it's a complicated dance, and we can talk more about that in the Q&A. Um, she shares a very similar biographical trajectory with many of them, and she was in close contact with quite a few of them, including Irving Howe, Irving Kristol, Alfred Kazin, Norman Podhoretz, and Nathan Glazer in the post-war years, particularly as they made a turn, if you will, towards a Jewish identity or an ethnicity um, in their renegotiation with American culture, with liberalism, and with ethnicity in the post-war years. One question that's guided my work has been why there, is nothing, there has been nothing written about Lucy S. Davidovich. How can we account for the lack of scholarly engagement with a central figure in shaping American Holocaust consciousness in the post-war years? Scores of books, and they keep getting produced, have been written about the New York intellectuals, about the men, none on Davidovich. There's a veritable cottage industry in Hannah Arendt, right? I and mean, we have two films in the last two years on her. So my biography will be the first full-scale treatment of her life, and it's only recently that other scholars happily, happily have examined select elements of her quite unusual biography, particularly her involvement with post-war reconstruction and the redistribution of Jewish cultural treasures, which was a transnational project in which figures such luminaries as Salo Baron, Gershom Sholem, Judah Magnus, Max Weinreich, and Hannah Arendt herself were involved. Lucy was instrumental to this effort too, as you'll see, and so we need to ask, why has she not merited more serious engagement? This is something that I'm still struggling with. I'm happy to hear your comments on it. One last prefatory comment. The debate about when Holocaust consciousness emerged in the United States was recently reopened. Davidovich, Davidovich both disproves and proves the claim, that an earlier claim, that the Holocaust only became central to the American Jewish community after 1967. And this is a view held by Peter Novick, to some degree by Alan Mintz. And they emphasized that the Holocaust was Americanized after the Six-Day War. Uh, Novick, in particular, and this is not true of Alan Mintz, uh, saw American Holocaust consciousness as a kind of conspiracy among the American Jewish establishment to uh, bolster American Jewish identity uh, with the modern state of Israel. Other scholars, and notably Jeffrey Chandler, who wrote a really fantastic book about American television in its during the war and right after the war, but including Lawrence Barron and also most recently Hasia Diner, have shown that an awareness of the destruction of European Jewry uh, 
which wasn't yet called the Holocaust in the United States, can be dated much earlier, already to the war itself. And they emphasized its multifaceted expression, which included newsreels, fiction, translation and publication of survivor testimony, radio and television broadcasts, local synagogue rituals, pamphlets, etc. The problem, or one of the issues, is that awareness of the destruction of the Jews of Europe and official study of it are not the same thing. And as we'll see, Davidovich was well aware, as were other American Jews, especially those with personal ties to Europe or because they were literate in Yiddish, of the European crisis and of the persecution of the Jews in the, in the 1930s. But she did not become a public figure associated with what we now call Holocaust studies until the late 1960s and particularly in the mid-70s. By then, she became a household name associated with scholarship on the destruction of European Jewry. Her major work, The War Against the Jews, 1933 to 1945, is still in print. In October 1987, Cynthia Ozick, a post-war American Jewish writer whose fiction, exemplified by her 1969 story, Envy, or Yiddish in America, was deeply embedded in East European Jewish culture. And she wrote this letter, part of which I've excerpted for you, to her very good friend, Lucy S. Davidovich, who apparently had threatened to destroy her papers. Please stop now, Lucy. It's ruthless, it's unfair, particularly in the case of Shimon's letters, which are safe, as safe as if written in code, because they're in Yiddish. If you don't have storage space, let a library take your papers. If you let it be known, two dozen universities will be at your feet, and you won't have to think about these documents anymore. And Shimon's letters, think how he would feel. He would be hurt, wouldn't he? Or if not, he would be pragmatic. He would admonish you. He would beg you to stop, Lucy. Imagine Shimon's thoughts concerning what you're doing. Imagine the thoughts of future scholars, of your biographers. We now know that despite her apparent despair, Davidovich listened to Ozick, at least partially. <laughs> I have yet to find any letter from Shimon to Lucy in her public archives or in her personal private archives. However, she saved her public papers, that is everything related to her scholarship and published writings, lecturing and research, and she entrusted them to her close friend, Neil Kozadoy, who was then the editor of Commentary Magazine, one of the most influential American Jewish periodicals in the post-war years. He was appointed her literary executor, and he was charged to bequeath her papers to the American Jewish Historical Society. The existence of this rich archive illustrates that she wanted to be remembered as a historian of the Jews of Eastern mm -hmm. Europe. She wanted not only ins to ensure that the history of the vital civilization of Ashkenazic Jewry be remembered, but she wanted to be remembered as its American chronicler. So who was she? Known primarily as a historian of the brutal destruction of European Jewry during the Holocaust, Davidovich was also a contentious female Jewish public intellectual whose life and work intersected with the central issues that shaped Jewish life in the 20th century, such as the viability of secular Jew Yiddish culture, the salvage and rescue of Jewish cultural treasures after the war, the Cold War ideological battle against communism, the crisis of post-war liberalism in the late 60s, the rise of feminism this, and the civil rights movement, as well as the new left, and their impact on Jewish communal life and on American historiographic trends, and the role of Jewish public intellectuals in New York City in the emergence of neoconservatism in the 70s and 80s. She wrote seven books, co-edited two, contributed over 60 articles to commentary at the height of its influence, and was an indispensable part of the research team at the American Jewish Committee the foremost Jewish defense agency in the United States in the post-war period. An outspoken figure in American Jewish communal life until her death in 1990, she became an intellectual touchstone for many Americans and American Jews, including the New York intellectuals by the late 60s, when she began to write publicly. She became known as one of the most important figures in the history of East European Jewry and the Holocaust. Tonight, I'm going to focus on her relationship to a field that we now call Holocaust studies. Within that field, she was a central figure in the group or the historiographic trend known as intentionalism, 
She argued that the final solution was the deliberate result of Hitler's virulent, murderous anti-Semitism, which governed both his domestic and foreign policy. In the 10th anniversary publication of her seminal work, The War Against the Jews, a book that made her famous, she reiterated her position, her intentionalism. It has been my view, now widely shared, that I would qualify, <laughs> that hatred of the Jews was Hitler's central and most compelling belief, and that it dominated his thoughts and actions all his life. The documents amply justify my conclusion that Hitler planned to murder the Jews in coordination with his plans to go to war for Lebensraum and to establish the Thousand Year Reich. The conventional war of conquest was to be waged parallel to and was able to camouflage the ideological war against the Jews. In the end, as the war hurtled to its disastrous finale, Hitler's relentless fanaticism in the racial ideological war ultimately cost him victory in the conventional war. By the mid-70s, her <coughs> writing informed both the general American discourse about Jews and the Jewish discourse about Jewishness, modernity, and political vulnerability. I argue, as part of my efforts to interpret American Jewish history as part of modern Jewish history, not as an exception to it, that the most productive way to understand Davidovich's work is to situate her in a continuum with the East European Jewish intelligentsia who turned to history writing as a tool in the development of their nationalist commitments already in the late 19th century. As a pioneer of Holocaust historiography in the United States, she represented an American link to East European <coughs> Korbenforschung, that is Holocaust research, and to the post-war transnational secular Jewish intellectual community. Born in 1915 to a Polish Jewish immigrant family, Lucy Schildkrit, that was her maiden name, was a typical second generation daughter. She was educated in New York's public schools. She attended the prestigious Huntra High School for Girls and as well as its selective college. But she was different from our male New York intellectuals in that she was steeped formally in institutions and acquainted with individuals committed to diaspora nationalism. Diaspora nationalism emerged in late 19th century Eastern Europe as an ideological response to anti-Jewish violence and to the political and economic obstacles facing acculturated Jews in the Russian and Habsburg empires. Diaspora nationalists in Eastern Europe believed that the Jewish people, as a concept, as an idea, preceded Judaism the religion. And they constructed institutions that they believed would create a modern, vital, secular Jewish future articulated in the vernacular language of East European Jewry, Yiddish. In the interwar years, Schildkrit attended the politically nonpartisan Sholem Alechem Folk Institute schools, was active in its youth organization, and she edited its student journal, which was <coughs> called Shrift. She also spent many summers at the Sholem Alechem Folk Institute camp, Camp Boibelik, directed by Leibish Lehrer a deservedly fabled figure of modern Yiddish education and diaspora nationalism. Mm. Lehrer was also a YIVO activist, and he became one of Lucy's consistent interlocutors as she grappled with questions of Jewish identity, particularly regarding the challenges faced by secular Yiddishists before, during, and after World War II. The Polish Jewish historian Jakob Szatsky, who was also a YIVO at, at, um, activist, had immigrated, had immigrated to the United States in 1922, and he had a decisive influence on her connection to interwar <coughs> East European traditions of Jewish history writing. He was her history teacher at Mittelschul, that is the high school weekend program of the Sholem Aleichem Folk Institute. And it was Schatzky who urged her to return to graduate school in history when she had lost interest in her English literature studies. With his encouragement, she applied to the YIVO's graduate program, which was called the Aspirantur in Vilna, Poland. Accepted by Max Weinreich, the Aspirantur's director, Schildkrit, at the age of 23, set sail for Poland in August 1938. This is a clipping from the Jewish Daily Vorwärts on this American girl who's going, as she said, in reverse, right? She's going back to Europe. In contrast to the German Jewish tradition of Jewish history writing, which is known as Wissenschaft des Judentums, which focused on ideas, religion, and intellectual life, 
YIVO's historical section and the Aspirantor program drew upon the Russian Jewish historian Shimon Dubnov's historical and scholarly commitments to diaspora nationalism. Dubnov wrote a very famous manifesto in 1891 entitled, Let Us Search and Research, A Call to the Wise Among Our People Who Will Volunteer to Collect Material on the Jews in Poland and Russia, unquote. This was written after the expulsion of Jews from Moscow, and Dubnov charged East European Jews to make historical research their national ethos. Quote, the construction of history is a national cause, and therefore all those in the nation who can write, all those who understand a book and appreciate history are obligated to participate in this work. Let us work together. Let us collect all the remote sources <laughs> from the scattered places, and let us arrange them and make them known to the public and use them for the building of the edifice of history. Let us search and research." Unquote. Four components defined Dubnov's historiographic agenda. First, he focused on Eastern Europe as the center of modern Jewish history. Second, he redire redirected Jewish historical writing away from the elite's ideas to the common people in their daily lives, which led, third, to his belief that history was the inheritance of every strata of Jewish society. Fourth, he saw source collection and history writing as tools in the development of Jewish national consciousness. Jewish historiography and the nationalist ethos that its study and dissemination produced could provide a substitute belief system for Jews who had broken with the narrative of sacred Jewish history with God as the central agent in historical change and the Jewish people as his subjects. As one Dubnov specialist has written, quote, more than any other Jewish thinker, Dubnov saw Jewish history as conveying the meaning of Jewish survival for secular Jews of his generation. The intensive study of the Jewish past had a deep, moral, almost mystical, albeit anti-religious, significance for him." Unquote. Dubnov's intellectual and ideological commitments were symbiotic. He believed that study of the Jewish past proved that the Jewish nation had been productive and creative th throughout its long diasporic existence because of its communal cohesion. The subtext here is his debate with Zionist historians, right, who would argue that the diaspora was um, uh, uh, feckless, and, and that it was the return to a historic land of Israel that would uh, rejuvenate the Jewish people. Dubnov, in contrast, structured his magnum opus called The World History of the Jewish People around the dynasties and states that governed the Jews during periods of political sovereignty and around what he called their political surrogates, such as the Kihilot, the Jewish municipalities of Eastern Europe that ensured Jewish survival in the diaspora. These institutions embodied the politics of an apolitical, deracinated, yet spiritual people and allowed the Jews a certain degree of political autonomy, protected their ethnic religious culture, and assured their national future. Lucy Schildkut became deeply immersed in Dubnov's historiographic ethos as an aspirant at the Vilna YIVO. Established at YIVO's 10th anniversary in 1935, at which Dubnov himself g had given the inaugural lecture, the Aspirantur's goals were to train the next generation of researchers of East European Jewish history, culture, and language. The students concentrated on the socio-cultural, economic, and political developments of East European Jewish society in the past and in the present. They engaged an interdisciplinary approach that emphasized the agency of all intellectual and economic components within Jewish society, and they drew from a variety of fields, history, sociology, philology, demography, ethnography, economics, pedagogy, as well as other social sciences. Embodying, embodying Dubnov's commitment to the popular people, to the ethos of the nation, YIVO created a cadre of lay source collectors called Zamlers as part of its mission to have the people engaged in gathering the sources of its own past and present and to write history as a tool of Jewish nationalism. In the program's fourth cohort, this is the group of Aspirant of Aspiranten in 1938 Vilna, a few but not many who survived besides Lucy. She was one of 16 fellows and the only American. And her thesis topic was on the Yiddish press in England. And this you here you see the the list for all of us who teach, the list of thesis topics. And there's her topic. It says, Liebe Schildkret, New York, 
the Yiddish press in England. In Vilna, she immersed herself in East European Jewish culture, society, and language. Taken under the wing of Yigo, Yivo activist Zelik Kalmanovich and his wife Rivala, she researched her thesis, worked on her Yiddish, and juggled the demands to translate documents into English for Weinreich and others associated with the institution. She also did what all students do. She dated, she danced, she attended lectures, she drank, and she took field trips to the Polish countryside. And this again, remember, this is the fall of 1938. So I think it's always important to realize that no one knew, right? Just, you don't know. None of us is a prognosticator, right? She, no one knew. No one knew. Um, all the while, and the pollsters certainly didn't know, right? Um, all the while aware of the drumbeats of war around her. Their fierce banging did not deter her from considering a second year in the Aspiron tour. But her world imploded on August 27, 1939, when Hitler and Stalin signed the Non-Aggression Pact, which effectively divided Poland and made war inevitable. A few days later, Davidovich fled in a harrowing journey from Vilna to Warsaw, through Nazi Germany to Copenhagen, arriving home, of course, on a ship a month later. During the war, she worked in New York City at the skeletal Yivo with Weinreich, Max Weinreich, who had been spared the fate of Polish Jewry. Together, they maintained the Evo's mission to research, document, and publicize East European Jewish culture and history. Contact with the few fortunate Polish Jewish refugees who were given exit visas during the war and with the Yiddish press made Schildkret aware, before many other Americans, of the deportations, ghettoization, and murder of Europe's Jews. Already in 1940, she was <coughs> responsible for drawing the outline of the perimeter of the Warsaw Ghetto enforced between October and November of that year. This is published in um, a YIVO publication, YIVO Blätter, from New York. With Weinreich, she worked on a comprehensive bibliography of YIVO's publications between the years of 1925 to 1941, which they published later in 1943. By the war's end, the world and people she had known in 1938 had been completely destroyed. After the war, she returned to Europe to work with the American Jewish Joint Distribution Committee in its education department in the DP camps. She helped the nascent <coughs> historical commissions in the DP camps <coughs> and midwifed the publication of Von Letzten Holden from the recent destruction, which was the historical journal of the Central Historical Commission. She helped secure the Yiddish linotypes for its maps, for its mats, excuse me. As well, her Yiddishist academic commitment made her central to the role in returning Ivo's library after the war. She was able, and this is a complicated story about which I've written as well as some other people have written, she was able to negotiate time away from her duties working for the education department of the JDC to work in the Offenbach Archival Depot, which was the repository of the plundered Judaica from Europe's great Jewish libraries, not the um, play Kodesh, not the Torah mantles and things like this, but the books and the archives. After three months of tedious cataloging at the, at the depot, 420 cases of books, newspapers, printed music, and archival materials belonging to the Vilna Yivo, the Strasson Rabbinic Library, and to Weinreich himself were shipped to New York, arriving on July 1st, 1947. She herself returned to the United States in mid-December 1947. She soon married Shimon Davidovich, a Warsaw native, whose first family had been murdered in the war, including a daughter, Topcha, who had been a fighter in the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising. Topcha's photograph and posthumous degree hung over, over Shimon, her father's desk, in their apartment, a shrine-like memorial to Jewish resistance that would later shape Lucy's response to accusations about East European Jewish political passivity. Indeed, Lucy's first post-war job was as a researcher and Yiddish translator for the novelist John Hersey for his book, The Wall, one of the first English no novels on the Warsaw Ghetto and the fourth best-selling book of 1950. This is uh, the jacket cover of the original book. She was then hired by the American Jewish Committee where she was employed in its research division for two decades. At the committee, she covered Cold War, liberal anti-communism, church-state relations, what was then called the Negro-Jewish Negro -Jewish relations, 
and the crisis, crisis of the urban metropolis. She also found time to write book reviews, often about East European Jewry and Jewish politics, and regular articles for the American Jewish Yearbook. Her husband, Shimon, was a copy editor at the YIVO, and their personal lives intersected with East European Jewish refugees, Yiddishists, and circles of self-identified New York Jewish communal activists. In the middle of her second decade at the committee, she embarked on a major work of Jewish historical writing, The Golden Tradition, The Jewish Experience in Eastern Europe which, when published, would transform her from back office researcher, researcher to major public figure. The Golden Tradition included autobiographical primary sources of Hasidic masters, rabbis, enlightened Jews, <coughs> publicists, poets, converts, visual artists, revolutionaries, even texts penned by a woman or two, and they were translated from Russian, Polish, Yiddish, German, and Hebrew. Together, they illustrated the diversity of Jewish intellectual life in Eastern Europe. The excerpts allowed the Jews of Eastern Europe to voice their own dynamic history in an intimate, accessible manner. The Golden Tradition represented her conscious decision to carry Dubnov's historiographic baton to America's shores, a commitment shared by Weinreich himself. He, too, now viewed Yivo's mission as a combination of academic rigor and populism. Weinreich wrote, our contribution in the struggle of the common Jewish people for their cultural emancipation can be expressed on one foot. Whatever modern scholarship brings to light, we, we want to bring back to the Jewish masses. Later in life, Davidovich articulated her book's method. History from the perspective of the participant or the participant observer conveys an immediacy, an imminence that cannot always be captured in history, which is written on the basis of documents alone from a remote past. This is from her introduction, and you can see very much her, uh, the influence of Dubnov as Eastern Europe as the center of modern Jewish existence. You can also, she wrote a very long introduction to the anthology, about 80 pages, kind of a whole sweeping history of moder the modernization of East European Jews. And you can feel Dubnov um, throughout, his influence throughout the essay, particularly his focus and hers on this idea of the Jewish community. Her introduction described the Jews as a community governed by a kahal, the Jewish municipality, which in, in encountering the modern world gave rise to a natural efflorescence of ideological, political, and linguistic creativity that reflected the Jews' national cultural autonomy. The Council of the Four Lands and Dubnov's view of it as a surrogate for the nation's political activity, which sustain, sustained its autonomy and safeguarded its autonomous culture, shaped the introduction. Even in extremis, East European Jewish communal life nurtured the Jewish nation. In the introduction's last section, called Jewish Politics Under Despotism and Dictatorship, which foreshadowed her next book and her defense of Jewish political behavior, she argued that interwar Polish Jews' national religious communal identity had remained intact, despite the government's recognition of them only as a religious union. She also concluded that the multiplicity of interwar Polish Jewish political parties could be viewed, many people have criticized the fragmentation of Jewish politics in the Second Republic, but she viewed it as, quote, an instrumentality for strengthening Jewish identity and increasing Jewish self-reliance. It was evident this, fragmenta this fragmented, very cacophonous Jewish political world were the first signs of a modern secular Jewish society. Like Dubnov, Davidovich concluded that despite interwar Polish Jewry's ultimate powerlessness, they possessed moral authority, a unique Jewish quality, quote, that no other politically powerless minority in Poland exercised, unquote. There are other intellectual debts in the introduction, most notably an acknowledgment, remember this is 1975, of the centrality of religion to the creation and shaping of Jewish nationality. Dubnov himself, who was personally agnostic, had also nodded to the centrality of Judaism, <coughs> but Davidovich is going to run with it for all kinds of reasons from the 70s forward. Weinreich himself, too, had shifted after the war. He was always a secularist, but in the post-war years, he too had begun to reassess the relationship of Yiddish, the Yiddish language, to Jewish history, arguing in his 1945 speech, Yiva on the Problems of Our Times, for a seamlessness between Yiddish and Jewishness. 
1953, Weinreich penned an essay called Yiddish and Yiddishkeit, in which he insisted that despite the secularization of Yiddish, it had emerged in the context of a pre-modern community defined by what he would later call Derech Hashas, best translated as the rabbinic tradition. The Yiddish language, he now argued, had always been anchored in Judaism. Again, for Weinreich, this is a shift. Yiddish and Hebrew, Hebrew, were completely intertwined as well. Reviewing his history of the Yiddish language and commentary, Davidovich wrote, quote, for in the final analysis, the religious culture created the Yiddish language. Only Yiddishkeit had the power to ensure the distinctiveness of the Jews that made them resistant to complete assimilation into the non-Jewish civilizations that they inhabited. Yiddishkeit interpreted in this manner guaranteed the survival of the Jews. Like Dubnov, Davidovich sought existential meaning in the writing of Jewish history. In this regard, the golden tradition, despite its revision of the static image of East European Jewry, the static sentimental image, was resonant with an elegy for the destroyed communities of, East, of European Jewry. The, do, the book touched an exposed nerve among the broad public, which was now ready to acknowledge the profundity of the catastrophe that had exterminated Polish Jewish civilization in particular. You know, all of European Jewry suffered, but Polish Jewish society and civilization was completely destroyed. The Golden Tradition earned critical review in the major English language press, and it launched her professional career, her public career. She was soon appointed at uh, Stern College at Yeshiv University as the Paul and Leah Lewis Chair on Holocaust Studies. This is before she wrote The War Against the Jews. And she um, later, uh, as we'll see, taught one of the first courses on the Holocaust. <laughs> The Golden Tradition, therefore, represented a literary form of what I'm calling, Horben, of what is called Horben Forschung. Now, this term, Horben Forschung, the scholarship on destruction, <laughs> was coined by the Lvov-born survivor historian Philip Friedman. It contained within it a sacral link to the epical destruction, right? The Horben, in Yiddish, is the Horben refers to the destruction of the temples in Jerusalem. In our context, it means the tradition of East European Jewish historical writing that responded to destruction, meaning anti-Semitism, from a wellspring of deep national identity. Horben Forschung sought not only to do exemplary <coughs> academic research, but to provide succor to survivors of violence in order to sustain the Jews' collective future. Friedman, a professional trained historian, experienced ghettoization during World War II, and lost his first wife and daughter during the Holocaust. In 1947, he helped organize the first conference in Europe that brought together all of the groups that were collecting Jewish survivor testimonies. His academic training influenced the methodological principles for research on the Holocaust in all the post-war Polish centers, and later in Israel, Palestine and then Israel, and in the United States, where he, where he was able to immigrate. He contributed to the methodological debates in the field by distinguishing between what he called Nazi-centric and Judeo-centric sources. Today we call these perpetrator and victim sources, right? It's the same binary. His work probed the tensions that continue to inform Holocaust research today. Tensions among the commitment to, quote, objective historic research, the desire to commemorate the dead, the pragmatic use of evidence for criminal trials, as well as the balance between Jewish and universal interpretations of the catastrophe. <coughs> Davidovich and Friedman knew each other well. They had worked together in the post-war refugee camps, and they were both associated with the YIVO and Columbia University after the war. They shared a commitment to Jewish historical agency, to chronicling the destruction of European Jewry in as professional a manner as possible, and to deploy sound historical research as a source of Jewish collective memory. They were, they didn't, uh, they weren't, um, good friends, I would say. They were, had, there was, um, a lot, there was quite an amount of personal tension between them. It's one of the stories here. She was, Lucy Davidovich had escaped the Nazi onslaught, and she wasn't a survivor, but she did consider herself a kind of quasi-survivor of the Holocaust. And to the American Jewish poet 
poet Irving Feldman, author of a collection called The Pripyat Marshes and other poems. When it first came out in 1966, she wrote him this letter. And I'm going to let you read it because I'm aware of the time. And you can read it as well as I can, and it's nice and clear. Um, she dedicated all of her books, except one on American Jewish history, to the murdered Jews of Europe. And I'll show you those titles in a minute. I want to give you time. And her most famous book, obviously, The War Against the Jews, exemplifies the aims of Horben Forschung. The War Against the Jews put Lucy Davidovich on the map and played a central role in recasting American Holocaust memory culture to focus on particular crimes against the Jews. These are her books. These are the dedications. On crimes against the Jews as opposed to crimes against humanity. By the mid-70s, the Holocaust and Jewish ethnicity occupied a central role in American culture, and the Holocaust had begun to enter the American Academy. At least 30 reviews of the book appeared in a variety of American and American Jewish academic and popular periodicals, including the Times and the Times Book Review and Commentary, among many others. Praise for the work also came in private form. Her personal archive contains scores of letters from major figures of the international Jewish world. The book made her a public Jewish intellectual. It was one of the first English language syntheses of the Holocaust, thus earning, her, thus earning her a pride of place in the pantheon of pioneer historians of the Holocaust. It also staked important claims about the events that engulfed Germany and the Jews of Europe between 33 and 1945. First of all, she believed that ideas and ideology were motor forces in history. Second, she argued that individuals, and in this case, powerful male leaders, affected historical change. As part of her critique of the philosophic and political Marxism and structural, structuralism regnant among certain academic circles from the 60s forward. She rejected approaches to the past that emphasized so socioeconomic conflict, bureaucratic, bureaucratic formation, or the disembodied framework of modernity. She believed that individuals were agents of their lives and made moral or immoral choices with them. Her focus on Hitler's actions and on ideology as a historical force was both a historical and political judgment. Ideas married, mattered in history generally. Anti-Semitism was an all-consuming force in Hitler's mind particularly. And the course of modern German history and modern Jewish history was inexorably informed by the confluence of these forces. Other ancillary yet important force factors, including Germany's defeat in World War I, economic depression, and fear of Soviet imperialism were, were important, obviously, but they were secondary causes that laid the foundation for the building of a demonic campaign against the Jews. In the war against the Jews, she positioned herself as the ideological op opponent to the perspective on Jewish politics and history offered by Raoul Hilberg's The Destruction of the European Jews in 1961, a book which she praised, praised initially and Hannah Arendt's Eichmann in Jerusalem, published in 1963. These books are different, but they have become conflated. Again, we can talk about why, partly because Arendt credited Hilberg in her own work. He disassociated himself from her, but nonetheless, that's the way these things played out. And these works, uh, um, which primarily use non-Jewish sources, that is, they were perpetrator history books, colluded in a representation of European Jewry as active agents in their own destruction. Divided into two sections, Lucy's book, which divided by the final solution and the Holocaust, the war against the Jews was preoccupied not only with arguing that Hitler intended the full extermination of the Jews from the very beginning of his rise to power. She was also equally concerned with describing and paying homage to the rich communal culture that he had destroyed. She set out to refute Hannah Arendt's censure in Eichmann in Jerusalem of the cultural and political weakness of European Jewry and of the complicity of the Jewish leadership in the destruction of the Jews. Davidovich's insistence that the hounded Jews of both Western and Eastern Ashkenaz had responded with life-affirming dignity illustrated her debt to Dugnov's view that the communal autonomy of the Jews bequeathed to them a spiritual strength that could not be measured by temporal political judgments. The war against the Jews channeled Horben Forschung's ethos of commemorating and defending the dead. 
Part two of Davidovich's book was, in Philip Friedman's terms, Judeocentric. Its source material derived from the Jews themselves, not from the perpetrators. She wrote, consistently I have used Jewish sources as the lenses through which to view the Jewish community and to analyze Jewish behavior, unquote. She devoted the eight chapters of the Holocaust section of the war against the Jews to Jewish communal life, beginning with the, organization of German, the organizations of German Jews. She challenged Arendt's analysis of Jewish political passivity by arguing that the Jews' political organizations were not feckless. Their power lay in their ability to strengthen and build Jewish communal and cultural life. They endeavored to hold on to the, quote, achievements of the emancipation. Making 1939 after Kristallnacht as a turning point after which no vestige of Jewish communal autonomy in Germany remained, she insisted that any decisions made by the Jews serving in Jewish organizations from that period forward were dictated from without. That is, they had no choice. Moving eastward, she described and defended the work of the Jewish communal functionaries. To her, to Lucy Davidovich, the men of the Judenlete, the Jewish councils, were, quote, men of decency and integrity, imbued with the tradition of service to the community, unquote. While emphasizing the utter discontinuity of Nazi persecution of the Jews with other forms of pre-modern anti-Jewish hatred, she nonetheless stressed that the behavior of the community leadership during the Holocaust was continuous with earlier patterns. The men of the Judenrette employed intercession and bribery, age-old methods of Jewish-Gentile interaction to cope with Nazi demands. They tried to buy time for the ghettoized Jews by emphasizing the community's economic productivity, hoping that a productive ghetto could offset plans for its liquidation. They continued to practice the politics of Dina di Malchuta Dina, respecting the law of the Gentile state, not knowing that this state was a murderer, not a protector, as it had been for most of the pre-modern Jewish past. Naked coercive power increasingly defined the relationship between the Nazi state and the Jews under their subjugation. With this emphasis, she defended the Jewish leadership, the Jewish leadership to its very end, a direct counter to Arendt's claim that the men of the Judenrat Yunretta had collaborated with the Nazis. Her focus on Jewish communal life expressed her Dubnovian belief that the Kahal, the Jewish community, embodied the collective and historical agency of the Jewish people. Even her position regarding the limited autonomy, limited agency, excuse me, of the German Jewish communal leadership after 38 and of the Judenrette allowed her to defend and justify their behavior in its darkest hour. The Jewish leadership in ghettoized Europe were, according to Davidovich, quote, animated to keep the Jews alive, to sustain them physically and morally. East European Jewry's greatest weapon, tautologically, was its historical solidarity and its communal will to live. She hoped her work would not only correct the image of East European Jewry among historians and the general public and commemorate its vitality, she hoped it would raise the Jewish consciousness of post-Holocaust American Jews. To that end, too, she offered one of the first college courses on the subject. She wrote a documentary history, a companion volume on the Holocaust called The Holocaust Reader. And she wrote a study of Holocaust historiography called The Holocaust and the Historians. She became, with Elie Wiesel, one of the most important public authorities in the United States on the Holocaust. In 1978, she was invited to join the President's Commission on the Holocaust, which she shortly resigned thereafter because she disagreed with their uh, ideas about the representation and interpretation of the events. Nonetheless, despite this step away, she was invited to lecture throughout the country in the 70s and 80s. Evidence of the rise in Holocaust consciousness in the United States and her role in creating it, a role about which she was somewhat ambivalent, mind you. She hoped that her work would provide post-war American Jews with a link to the grandeur of the living Jewish past, particularly that of Ashkenazic Jewish civilization, not merely to its destruction. She anticipated the recent efflorescence of works on the connection between Jewish historical writing, Jewish memory, and Jewish identity. In 1978, she delivered a lecture entitled, What is the Use of Jewish History for the American Jewish <coughs> Historical Society? Only published in 1990, the lecture outlined four criteria by which one could combine both pro professionalism and a Havasus Royal, 
the love of Israel, love of Israel, Ahavat Yisrael in Hebrew. Some of you may know this is a phrase in a very famous or infamous exchange between Gershom Shalom and Hannah Arendt on the book, Eichmann in Jerusalem. So that's another kind of textual resonance with what she's thinking about vis-a-vis -vis countering Arendt. History writing for Jews had to be purposeful, Davidovich concluded. Taking into account the distinctive forces of Jewish history, she wrote, quote, whether we are believers or skeptics about providential destiny, we must admit that Jewish history follows its own laws. And Dubnov was also right. Jewish history, however dark and catastrophic, has in it the potential for Jewish survival. The sense of Jewish history and destiny is what every Jew who cares about the survival of his people feels in his bones." Unquote. Davidovich rejected the conceit of her time no longer ours, really, that a professional historian's personal commitments to her people, country, religion, or language, by definition, undermined her professional objectivity. Quote, personal commitments do not distort, but instead they enrich historical writing. Unquote. Reviewing Yosef Chaim Yerushalmi's Zachor, Jewish History, Jewish Memory, in 1983, she concluded, quote, in my view, all our great historians have evolved a modern equivalent to prompt collective Jewish consciousness. Driven by a commitment to Jewish survival, they have animated their work with that commitment." Unquote. History could be seen as a binding national force. Indeed, all great historians have been advocates, as it were, of their nation's history. Despite Yerushalmi's own disclaimer about the rupture between his academic calling and prior generations of Jewish historians, she saw his work, as have many others since, as building a bridge to his people. To conclude, in 1938, a young, working-class American immigrant daughter of Polish Jews sailed to Poland on a trip that transformed her life. And we can now see it would have a decisive impact on the ways in which American Jewry in the second half of the 20th century would encounter East European Jewish history and culture. In the fateful last year before the Nazi onslaught against European Jewry, which would result in the almost total decimation of Polish Jewry, and on her post-war sojourn in the DP camps, Lucy Schildkrit acquired a European soul, henceforth identifying herself wholeheartedly with the history, culture, language, and fate of Polish Jews. When she turned to writing the history of the Jews of Europe, she did so as part of a conscious link to the East European Jewish historiographic tradition of Chorbenforschung, the research on destruction. This tra tradition derived from the historical vision and methods of the ideologue of diaspora nationalism, Shimon Dubnov, who saw Jewish historical research as a tool in developing Jewish historical consciousness, which, in turn, would foster national belonging and survival in the diaspora. Living and writing in New York City, in what was then the largest Jewish community of Ashkenazic origin in the world, Davidovich unapologetically charged herself with continuing Dubnov's historic, historiographic tradition on American shores. Thank you very much. <laughs>